interesting. We're talking about the in integration of knowledge. But even to develop an integral conception of knowledge, uh, we are all approaching it from different perspectives. Uh, and when I conceived of this session, I was thinking of something else. But every, every contribution has been very rich. Uh, Carlos, I loved your paper and I loved your presentation. Uh, and those of you who want to read the paper, it will be out in Cadmus next month and you'll all uh, and I recommend it. It's a really st stimulating, thought-provoking paper. Uh, Carlos was really talking about integrating ideas. Ideas that integrate thought in the physical plane, in the plane of life, in the plane of mind. And he even suggested maybe we can integrate or unify between the three in future. And that's a, a, a great challenge for us. And I'm going to come back with a question at the end. Uh, Marta uh, raised at the break today a, a part of, of this topic, which I hadn't conceived at all. I don't know why, because we're deep in it all the time. She, she said she wants to talk about the integration of faculties. The knowledge, each faculty has a capacity to reflect a different dimension of reality. And she wants to talk about if we really want to grasp reality, we need to use all the faculties, which actually, when I come to think of it, was a basic premise for this course. <laughs> but when I was thinking of integration of knowledge, it didn't, it didn't come to mind. Uh, Chandrasekharan was talking about the integration of conceptual systems, because the conceptual system on which allopathic uh, medicine is based and the conceptual system on which uh, Ayurveda is based, are quite distinct from one another. Uh, here is a focus on uh, health as the absence of disease, and in Ayurveda and many other traditional systems, it's more of a focus on the harmony of the whole, a concept of health. It reminds me, I mentioned in my opening remarks, that uh, our conception of peace, our definition of peace in the West is uh, absence of war. We have a fellow in the academy, Robert Van Harten, who's been working on a thesis of a positive, holistic conception of peace. Because obviously the absence of war is not, uh, is not the totality of what peace is at all. It's only uh, uh, one of the, the conditions. Now, in my comment, I'd like to talk about on the subject just to kind of round it out. And uh, fortunately, I don't have to go into details on this because this is what the whole course has been about. But if I had a chance to redo it, I would have added three other dimensions that Carlos talked about, the integration of ideas. Uh, uh, Chandrasekharan talked about the integration of conceptual <coughs> systems, and, uh, which you also did in the physical uh, level between quantum, quantum mechanics and relativity. And Marta talked about the integration of faculty. So it tells us how much we have to think about what is, what is integration. And what is it we are integrating? So these are themes that uh, we have already addressed, and we fortunately we have sessions on each of them. But I thought it would be helpful just to kind of look at it and, and put it together. And so I'm going to briefly talk about four dimensions of integration, and with brief illustration, just to try to make it concrete what we're talking about. The first of these is what we commonly think about integration of knowledge, and that is we want to get the different disciplines together that are fragmented. We want interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary uh, research because we realize the reality is more complex and it can't be covered by any particular field. These are examples, real life examples, that we're grappling with in our work on economic theory. We're struggling to say that a real, a new economic theory has to fully integrate the political dimension. Ironically, the original name of economics was political economy, <laughs> and now uh, a, a lot of economics is to deny uh, that we should have any politics involved in it at all. But certainly Adam Smith, and in the beginning, he very well understood that it is the governance structure that determines how an economy works. But yet we, uh, we, and Winston's point in all of his writings is uh, that the economic system is fundamentally based on legal concepts, which could be very different than they are. 
uh, economist has been writing recently about the fact that uh, there's no reason that we need to have copyright and patent laws which extend uh, property rights, intellectual property rights for decade after decade because there's no evidence that more than, if extending it more than 10 years really stimulates innovation and helps the society. This is the economist arguing that we have extended rights beyond the level that's beneficial to the society. So it's a fundamental issue. These are all, I think they're self-explanatory. The one that's most obvious to us all, and we're discussing is, the, how can we have a theory of economy that excludes the ecology? Can we really have, but we did have, for 200 years, we had economic theory that just took an infinite, eco, an, an infinite environmental base as the, uh, as the foundation for it. So obviously the interdisciplinarity uh, is necessary, inter integration across disciplines is self-evident. The second one, which we came up with, and now uh, Tibor has given us a more uh, 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 colorful or characteristic way, is that we need to look at not only the horizontal integration of knowledge across disciplines, but the integration of knowledge at different levels. And I mentioned in my opening presentation on think different ways of thinking that we do know that there are transdisciplinary principles. I'm talking now really in the social sciences. Uh, we do know there are principles that transcend particular disciplines that represent different depths of the reality that we're trying to study. And I put up here uh, one line, it's a, a thought from Sri Aurobindo uh, in a philosophical work in which he said that life evolves by consciousness, consciousness evolves by organization. Consciousness in the sense of, as uh, Carlos was talking about it, or just consciousness in the sense of awareness. Our evolution socially depends on our awareness. Only when we become aware of something can we then organize it to make it effective power. This is an example of a transdisciplinary principle that applies to economics, technology, uh, 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 scientific knowledge, uh, <coughs> politics, or any other field. And as I mentioned on the first day, the principles of social uh, systems theory are fundamentally transdisciplinary principles that can be applied across disciplines. So this is another level of integration which I'm calling uh, vertical. Uh, we are going to come to a course in the fall on social power because in our discussions in the Academy for New Paradigm we've identified, Winston has been very active on this, We've identified that you really can't talk about a new paradigm in any field, social field, without looking at where is power in the society. And how, not only is, how is power generated, which I'm calling social capacity, and how is power distributed. Whether it's the scientific, intellectual power, or the technological power, or the power of communications and the press, uh, or the power of money, or the political power, if we try to have a social theory that doesn't take into account how that power is being generated and utilized, we really cannot have a sense of the whole. And of course, ironically, almost all of economic theory after Marx ignores the underlying framework of who's got the power and how the power is being utilized. We say, well, it's the free market, it's the invisible hand that's distributing power, when in fact that's very far from true. The third dimension of integral knowledge or integration is a theme that we discussed yesterday and on the opening day and we will come back to, and that is how do we integrate the objective and the subjective dimensions of knowledge, and uh, uh, Rudy spoke to it and uh, others have spoken to it, Chandrasekhar in, in his earlier presentation, uh, and Winston has constantly been coming back to this, uh, that the most central thing in social science is what are the values that we're trying to realize? And yet social theory in its effort to be uh, appear to be a natural science has tried very often to be value free. 
Karl Popper warned against uh, what he called misguided naturalism in the social sciences, forgetting the fact that the social sciences are our attempt to realize values, not our attempt to arrive at an impartial knowledge of a physical reality which we're disconnected from. And then finally, a theme we also discussed briefly yesterday, and we had a whole course, two courses on this, the first two courses here, on what is the role of the individual and in the development and evolution of the collective. And this applies whether we're talking about science, because we really can't talk about any scientific development without talking about individuals or philosophical development, the, the, the contribution, or we were talking about Steve Jobs on the first day in, uh, in technology development. Uh, in every field, the individual is not just a particle, not just a nameless uh, particle like all of the others. The human individual is capable of a unique contradic uh, com contradiction <laughs> and uh, contribution. And any social theory, if it's going to be a, a unified, integrated theory, is going to have to tell us the relationship between the individual, whether it's an Abraham Lincoln or a Mahatma Gandhi or anyone else, or a Martin Luther King, and the totality. And we also have to be able to look at the transitions from the individual who pioneers, whether it's Copernicus thought or Einstein's thought, and how society responds to those innovations, resists them, imitates them, eventually accepts them, institutionalizes them, organizes them, and then makes them part of the culture. So very briefly, this is the topic of a six-day uh, course that we had, and all of the videos are up there, but I just wanted to show that this concept of integration is really, really challenging for us, even to think about what integration is. And if you look up in the dictionary, I think you'll be very disappointed with uh, the <laughs> definition of integration, which is very, it's used as a synonym for synthesis, but what are we synthesizing? Are we, uh, at what level are we synthesizing? So I'm putting back up that diagram from day one. It's, it's not adequate in itself. But to say, if we're talk, and we're also talking about an integrated whole, which is evolving, as Carlos was saying. It's not, this integral knowledge we want is evolving in time. The, 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 the reality is evolving in time. So there's a time dimension to it at all, to, as well. So ultimately, when we're talking about new paradigms, uh, we're talking about integration of knowledge. We can be thinking of it at all these levels, plus the ones that uh, the, uh, the speaker and other panelists uh, raised.